probably here with ten years older. Hello, my name is Leonard Hill. I'm the club newsletter editor. If you're wondering who I actually am in the club, uh, I'm going to put on a demo tonight for about digital photography. The uh, demo was actually the first part of probably a three-part demo. I don't know whether we're going to run them all in sequence or not yet. That kind of depends uh, on what people want to do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the demo is finished. It was finished about 3 o'clock this afternoon, and we were supposed to have a CD available, except that uh, front page sometimes doesn't exactly cooperate when you're making CDs, and uh, the references, instead of being reflexive so that it can work with anything, it decided to hard code them right to my drive configuration, which is entirely different than what most people would ever have. So they won't work when they're a CD, so we have to go back and manually edit this whole presentation to get it fixed, but we can show you what we've got and go through this thing. Okay. Uh, how many people here have digital cameras? Okay, how many people are thinking about buying a digital camera? Okay. This part, first part of the presentation, we're going to talk more about the cameras, what they are, what some of the things mean, and we're going to talk about correcting pictures rather than editing pictures, and I make a very definite distinction in that. Correcting the photograph is taking the overall picture and putting it back into alignment in terms of what it should be in terms of its color temperature and presentation and hue. Editing is more of going in, fixing blemishes, cracks, removing unwanted material from the backgrounds and so on and so forth. That will be part of the second presentation. And I'll ask you a little bit more about that after we're done because I want to know how deep do you want to go into that subject. The third part that we're talking about doing is going to deal more with things you can do with your camera besides just take pictures and how can you present them. And that, believe it or not, will take a whole evening because we're also going to throw one other important thing in there and that is managing your photographs. If you are an avid photographer, you can easily collect a hundred or more pictures a week. Okay. Where are they? What are they of? What do they look like? And so on and so forth. Okay. I probably have about three gigs of pictures from my digital camera. And my camera is an old camera. It's a even a megapixel. So they are a lot of photos out there. Okay? Let's start on this. Now I'm happy to see Mike brought my camera back and we'll talk a little bit about some specific things on cameras. This is the introductory screen as you'll see. Some of the titles aren't quite the same, we've changed it a little bit. This is just to give you an idea of what the series is going to look like. We're going to cover tonight. We're going to look at doing some editing on the next one, some advanced editing techniques. I've got three packages lined up right now to go through it and talk to you about on the second one. And we have some of the trial programs we've got from Adobe, so we can actually give you a working copy of Photoshop legally. Okay? It's a trial version, it's only good for 30 days. But uh, we can give them to you. And the third thing, we haven't outlined that yet, but uh, there are a lot of things we've been talking about. Chuck and I will probably co produce that demonstration because we have a lot of interesting things to cover. Okay, you get your disc, click on there, and up to the demo will come. First thing I want to talk to you about is digital photography itself. It's a lot like conventional photography or what we call chemical photography for those of you who've been involved in it. Uh, some of my background, I've been involved with photography since I was probably about 8 or 10 years old. I've had chemical darkrooms and have been in chemical darkrooms since that time up through about the last 20 years when I stopped chemical photography. I've handled I have a wide assortment of 35 millimeter cameras. I have medium range format cameras which are the 6x6 format cameras. Uh, I gave up my 4x5 speed graphic and my 4x5 view cameras uh, shortly after I got married because there just wasn't enough room for those things to drag them around. Uh, I've done wedding photography, child photography, landscape photography, and so on and so forth. Uh, I was part of the photo production department in college, and I also taught some of the classes in photography. So I'm not, quote, just the average candid snapshot-taking person, okay? You're going to learn to regret that by the time you've done. <laughs> you got to remember the family. We don't have a thousand pictures of <laughs> While it's a lot like conventional photography, 
there's a lot of things that the digital camera lets you do that you can't do with a conventional camera. And the most thing for, that you really have to realize is you see these shots in magazines and on television, and see, that's a beautiful shot. Why can't I do that? You can't do that because, one, you don't take enough pictures. A pro shoots 30, 40, 50 pictures, gets one, he's lucky, sometimes a lot more than that. When we used to shoot sports shots, we had a 35 millimeter camera for some of the shots. It had a winder on it, 25 foot roll of film. That's 10 rolls of film at your disposal. In a little over a minute and a half, it could shoot 25 feet of film. So when you caught someone running down the field who was making a play, you just played on the shutter and away it went. And we had a flashback that could keep up with it. It weighed 10 pounds, just the flash attachment. Okay? Camera weighed another five or six. Yeah, you got a good shot. You know? What was the cost? Probably a little bit on the high side, but you know, roll of fill at that point in time for 25 foot roll, about eight bucks. No big deal. You can't do that. You can't afford to go out and shoot two or three rolls of film and take them off and get them processed. But you can with a digital camera. And that's what you have to do. You have to learn your camera. You have to learn your subjects. Your total cost is some battery cost and some electrons you're going to throw away if you happen to mess up. Okay? You've probably already discovered, if you own a camera, that there's a lot more to just pushing that shutter and taking the picture. In digital photography, you have the best of both worlds, i.e., you can take things and edit them and do what you want with them, but you've also acquired the whole photo processing side of the operation. That used to send off to a lab, and Walmart isn't a custom photo lab, but you'd send them off and they would take care of that problem. Generally, your point-and-shoot camera pictures with film in them come out better than your digital pictures, right? The reason for that is that lab is actually editing and processing your picture. They are correcting it. There's a lot of latitude in a film camera, two f-stops typically, maybe three. And the lab runs those things through to print. They have chronometers there which balance the color, which change the exposure setting. So if you overexpose it or underexpose it, they automatically correct that with the computer. They go through that machine like that. When I used to work in the lab, it used to take a little longer. When we first started doing color, it was about an hour and a half of print. Now the process is a lot faster and a lot more automated. But when you're doing the digital photography, you're the one who has to do that correction. That's why if the picture doesn't come out well, you either aren't able to get a good picture out of it or you have a lot of work to get a good picture out of it. Okay? So there's a lot more to just pushing that shutter and what that camera does. Let's take a look at some of the terms that we've got in digital photography. The ones that I put here in blue are the ones which have some significance and some importance. I'm not going to run through everything here, but some of them. Aperture prior priority. You're not going to see this on most of your cameras, but it's a very important feature if you're a medium to high-end user because it will establish whether the size of the lens opening or the shutter is going to take control. If you're taking fast moving pictures, you want that sequence in there. Otherwise, you're going to get a blur. Artifact. You're going to see a lot of artifacts tonight, and you probably have a lot of this in your pictures. And what it is, it's just blotchiness that you see in your photos typically in the dark areas. And we're going to show you what that is and work a little bit on that. Aspherical lenses. Again, you're not going to find this in the low-end cameras. Medium to upper-end cameras, it isn't a feature, it's a characteristic of a lens. And what it means is it's a damn good lens. Autofocusing. You will find that in most all of the digital cameras. They will generally all do some type of autofocusing for you. It could be a real boom, and it could be a real bust, depending on what you're trying to do. CCD, CMOS, these are the types of devices that are picking up your picture. You're only interested in CCD. If you find a camera or even a net cam that's got a CMOS sensor in it, you don't want it. End of the discussion. It's just not going to give you the fall. Color temperature, again, important to know what it is but not get hung up on it. A lot of you here are old enough to remember we used to have blue flash bulbs, mm -hmm. used to have white flash bulbs. If we used the wrong ones, our pictures came out the wrong color. What we were trying to do is correct for color temperature. If we had outdoor filming, 
and we went indoors, we used blue fly sculpts. We had indoor film in, we used the white fly sculpts. If we took it outside, the pictures went the hell out of us again, okay? Working on the color temperature here. Dots per inch. We're going to have a whole section on this. And all that is, is how many little dots of color there are in an inch. And it's different for printers, and it's different for cameras, and we're going to talk about that. Depth of field. An important thing from a photographic standpoint, you need to watch it in your digital camera. What's up close is in focus. What's out back is that in focus. Sometimes that's a good feature. Sometimes that is not a good feature. And can you control that with your camera? You control that through your aperture settings, which is why that was important. A digital zoom. We're not too concerned about digital zoom. All you want to know about, remember about digital zooms is you don't want to pay for them. They don't do anything for you in terms of the quality of your picture. They just put half the number of dots over the same size. So it looks like you're closer, but the picture quality isn't any better than if you just took it regularly and, and blew it up when you made the print. Huh. The bad news is, is you can't go backwards from there. So digital zooms aren't too great. They talk about this camera has a 6x zoom capability. Well, that's nice. It's optical. But if it's a 2x optical zoom and a 3x digital zoom, it's a 2x zoom camera, end of the discussion. You won't get anything but blotches when you pick up that digital side of that. Interpolation. Interpolation just means it's a fancy word for averaging. I take a look at this dot, I take a look at that dot, and I assume the dot in the middle is halfway in between the two. Yeah, ain't worth much either. Okay? You'll see a lot of cameras, they will talk about interpolated pixels and interpolated megapixels. All that is is a fancy marketing tool to, get, to convince you that it's a better camera than what it really is. Anytime you see interpolation being offered, you're not interested. Because it's not real pixels. It's somebody's estimation of what that looks like. And if one picture is white and one picture is black, and it says, well, gee, it's half gray. Well, yeah. Is it a shadow, dark gray, or is it light gray? I mean, you know, it's just going to go 50-50 on it. That's the end of it. LCD monitors. That's just a little display that's on the back of the screens. They're very nice to have. If you're buying a digital camera, you probably want that. Some of the lower ends don't have it. And if it's just a point and shoot, you're going to use very casually, maybe okay, but the real reason for having that is to take a look at your picture and see if it's any good. That way you know whether you need to take another one. Uh, lens distortion. Again, once you buy your camera, that's what you're stuck with, but this is what we're looking to get rid of is lens distortion. One of the reasons we want to make sure we have a good lens. The spherical lenses, multi-element lenses, takes care of lens distortion. That's what you're looking for. Maximum aperture. All that says is how fast is that lens. For most pictures, it probably doesn't mean anything if you're taking flash or you're outside on a nice bright day. But if you get in this room and you're taking pictures across this room like we were taking in the Christmas party, and you don't have a good camera and you just shoot a flash picture, you're going to be in trouble after 10 feet. So what can that camera itself really do? The faster the lens, the better. Nickel hydride. Battery types. We're going to talk a whole section about batteries. Noise. Another problem with your picture. It can look like blotchiness. It can look like sparkle. We're going to show you a lot about this. Nothing you can really control. You control that when you buy your camera. Optical zoom. That's what we want. We want the actual optical ability of that lens to be able to make the magnification. Pixels smallest little element that exists of a picture, a color. Red, green, blue, whatever. Red eye. You've all seen that. That's when your kids look like demons in there, okay? We're going to talk a lot about that. How to get rid of it, how to eliminate it, how to avoid it. And the other thing we want to cover, lastly, is white balance. And all white balance is, that deals with the color temperature that we talked about up earlier. And white balance just says, I want to get to a neutral shade of white so that my pictures don't have an overcast yellow, green, or blue color. Nice feature. There's some penalties associated with that. We'll talk about that when we get into some of the cameras here a little bit more. Okay. 
Here's another book that goes through some charts if you want to get a little more into them, get some more detail on them. I'm not going to go into it. What do we want to look at in the camera? Okay. First thing you've got to ask yourself is, what am I going to use this camera for? What I want in the camera is not what you want in the camera. Okay. I want a camera that's going to have a good optical zoom. I'm going to want it to be able to take pictures in available light. I'm going to want multi-speed settings. I'm going to want a wide aperture control. I personally would prefer it didn't have a damn automatic setting on it because I'd like to override most of them. If you're going to give me some automatics, I want a way around them. Okay? If you want something to take pictures and not have to fiddle with it for three or four minutes, then that's not what you want. So it makes a big difference. <laughs> Your purpose for a camera is to take pictures for a catalog that's going to be on the web. Then you don't want a high-end camera. Or if you get a high-end camera, you have to make very sure that that camera can take pictures down in the 640 by 480 resolution mode of standard VGA. Why? Because it doesn't pay to display anything any larger than that on the web. If you buy a high-end camera to do that, then every single one of those you're going to get to resample and resize. And when you do that, you're going to lose quality. So what am I going to do with this camera? And of course, we all have the same problem here. There isn't a single lottery winner in this room. So I know money is also probably our prime consideration. What can we get within our budget? Okay, what are we looking to accomplish? I think we went through that. We've talked about the website. Printing, this is the other thing. What am I going to do with my pictures? If I want to make 8 by 10 glossies out of them, I need a high resolution camera. Not one with red and white stripes on it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Bill, we don't edit. He's stealing the show, that you we, realize uh, it. We, we just let the everything happen show. Why does it matter? I think it's right over the screen I'm doing it. Do I? It's right over the screen I'm doing it. Oh, for sure. Okay. It's still there. I'm sorry. Well, now he's what are you going to take with your picture? How many pictures are you going to take at a time? You're planning a long trip or a vacation. Digital cameras have a real drawback. With a film camera, it's relatively simple to put another roll of film in. Digital camera, you can put another piece of storage media in, but they're not three and four dollars a roll, so it costs you a lot more bucks. So you need some way to either get it off the camera or some way to change the resolution so you can store more pictures or something like that. Uh, <laughs> And the other thing down here, resolution really matters. And that's what we're talking about. Depending upon what I'm going to do with that camera, the more pixels I have, as a general rule, you want. Because that should express the true ability of that camera. And it does in theory. In practice, we're going to show you what happens. Okay? Also, the downside of more megapixels is you need more storage capability. Camera I shoot is ancient. It's a 0.8 megapixel camera. My pictures are 50K. A 1.3 megapixel camera has a 350K file. A 4 megapixel camera is pushing a megabyte. Get into the pro line, the new backs that they have for the, what they call the mid range cameras, the 6x6s, the millions, and the, the house of lives, are 16 megabytes per <coughs> shot. <coughs> four by five pro line cameras that will produce better than film quality images. They come out of those cameras at 120 megabytes a shot. Okay? Now none of us here are in that range, but even at even when you're pushing a meg per per shot, your storage media in your camera, you're talking about going from a 32, 64 to maybe 128, which is about hundred dollars a piece for each memory storage <coughs> module you have. If you can't afford too many of them, then you need to get some way to get it off that camera, either into a laptop computer or into a, another machine somehow. If you don't have a laptop, there's something else you're going to get into. Or you're going to need one of the belt storage units where you can put your cards in and they'll offload the darn thing. So everything is a plus and everything is a minus, depending upon what you're trying to optimize to.
Lens features, we kind of covered most of that. We talked about what the zoom lens is. One thing we didn't cover was the macro lens capability. What you take pictures of kind of determines how good that's going to be and what you need that for. I like to take a lot of pictures of flowers. I'm in two, three inches away, four inches away from my subject with them. I need, good, I need a good macro capability in my camera. My camera has a fairly good one. This here is a, a much better camera in terms of its specifications. That's one of the features they left off of this camera. So if you're going to go in and take close-up pictures, it's not going to do it. If you need it, you know, you want it to be there. And it's a little bit more than that. Some cameras can have this feature, but when you go in, it isn't very good. Others, it is, and we'll show you some of that. Software, I'm going to leave that alone. You can read that in here, and you can look at the plugins and all the other kind of good stuff in here. Uh, at some other time, we're going to cover software in a bit, a little bit differently. Let's talk about one of the favorite things here, and this is artifacting. This is back to this noise problem. This is what you want to avoid in your pictures and what you want to make sure that your camera avoids. It deals with the noise that you're going to see in the background of photographs. We're going to show you that. It deals with the type of a bias that your sensor has in terms of its color and its balancing and how it works. There's no specifications for these things. Okay? Different types of things you can see when one light spills over into another and you get a blooming effect. You get pixelization when things start to get very jaggy. We've kind of covered interpolation, uh, where they're averaging things out to kind of get better. Compression is what happens to your image when it's stored. Lower end cameras store pictures they take as a JPEG. You're finished. That's your choice. You get into the upper, leg, upper side of the coin. Cameras will give you compression ratios that you can set your JPEG quality for. 80%, 90%, 95%, 100%. Get up into the real good cameras, they will give you a choice to put out an image in a TIFF format, tag image format. That's everything. No compression, no loss. Huge files. <laughs> if your camera's hooked up with Bluetooth, or if it's hooked up with an 802.11 device, where you're in a studio, you're in your car, where it can transmit 10, 15 feet away, it's no problem. You can have all that stuff. You can have, you know, you can have one of these things sitting there running. There, there's your photo album. Okay? But if you're out taking a picture someplace and you don't have that, that gets to be a real issue because now the storage requirement, you fill up, you can fill up a 64 megabyte storage module, one, two shots. Uh, shaping, unshaping, masking, later. Resolution. This is one that everybody gets confused about. It's bad in cameras, and it's bad, it's worse in scanners. <clears throat> Resolution relates to pixels. It relates one way in cameras and another way in printers. They are not the same. So when they talk to you about pixels and dots per inch, you've got to find out what they're talking about. In a camera, it's a constant. It doesn't matter whether your camera has a half-inch diameter sensor or a third-inch diameter sensor. The number, number of megapixels is the same thing because they talk about a fixed pixel. When you go into printing, they talk about pixels per inch. And printers print 300 dots per inch, maximum. What it, the, the thing that they have made here is, is a fairly good article. Let me get down here where they're talking about printing these things out. In a printer, it's not constant. And where this gets to be bad is what can you do with what you get? If you have a camera that does 1.8 megapixels and you printed this out on a 4x5 print, it'll look pretty good. But that 4x5 print was actually a piece of rubber, okay? And you stretched it out. Those pixels get further apart, spread further and further apart. When they get up to the side where that 4x10 is now four times larger and it's an 8x10, that's what your picture is going to look like. So if you print 8x10s, your pixels are spread out four times more than what they are on a 4x5. So as the print size starts to get larger, you need more megapixels. Now, if you're taking the whole frame, that's one issue. So well, I don't print anything that big 8x10. 
But if you decided you only want to print a quarter of your frame, because that's where the subject is, and you're going to print it on a 4 by 5 you've accomplished the same thing as taking the full frame and printing it on an 8 by 10 So if you don't have the megapixels going in, when you get it over to your printer, you're not going to be able to get them coming out. <clears throat> and that's about all. There's more there. You can read that. Okay. So what we did is we took three cameras. This one here is a relatively new camera. It's less than a year old. It's an Argus DC3200, 1.8 megapixel camera. It's got all the basic features that you'd expect to find on a camera. It's got the back screen. It has actually a menuing system that comes up in here so you can control the camera with the menu. It's real nice. It's got nice, easy to use controls. It's got a flash attachment. It's easy to hold. It's easy to shoot one-handed. The specs on this camera look very respectable. This one is a digitized version of the 1950 Brownie Box camera. It's got a flash attachment on it. It's pretty well locked in. It's got an F8 lens on it. You can't adjust it. You can't do anything with it. It does have some variable shutter speed on it, so you, you can get a little bit uh, of change there. That's basically what it is. This camera, by the way, has an F2.8 lens on it, very fast lens, and variable shutter mm -hmm. speed. This camera is ancient, 0.8 megapixel camera. It's got controls that are very hard to use. It's very hard to use. I brought my hat here, and you've been wondering why I got this stupid hat sitting here. But there's a reason for it. I got my hat on, and I take a picture like that, this camera will take my hat. <laughs> I have a lot of pictures like that. <laughs> it's about that much of the bill, okay? Would you like a more stylish hat to wear? No, I, you know, I don't think I want you to bill, thank you. It's got the LCD screen on the back, and you can view your pictures with it. You want to set this camera and do anything to it, you have to plug into it and run it over on a special cable into a serial port into a special software. Again, it's an older camera. Okay? Let's take a look at this. What we did was try to run more or less conventional photo tests, not to show great photographic ability, but to pick up and show problems. Okay? I'm not going to tell you which camera is which. Here are three pictures of a black object with white, with lots of contrast, selected purposefully. Any of these pictures, you can bring them up to full size by clicking on You'll see a lot of blooming, is one of the terms we talked about in here. You get down here and you look at this, you'll start to see some pixelization, some blocking in here. You'll also see some artifacting in any of the dark areas. The exposure control on the camera was fooled by this white object. It set the exposure wrong, washed out the whole background. You can't see anything on this picture. The second camera did a lot better. Its exposure wasn't full. There's a white car in the background. You couldn't even see that in the other photograph. There's no blooming or very little blooming on here. And there is no pixelization and blotching in this. The other camera, all these pictures were taken from the exact same spot. I didn't move. I had all three cameras in my hand. All I did is pick them up put them down. Okay? The differences in the red and the size of the picture you see has to do with the focal length of the lenses, which we'll talk about. And here's the other one here. You remember the difference, look at the difference between the two white cars. The other one was completely white, the car is slightly gray, there's great tonal resolution. <coughs> in the whole picture, there is no blotching, there is no pixelization. The exposure is right on the mark. Next photograph. Trying to look at depth of field on a camera. Very close subjects, very far subjects. Again, watching this in the background, somewhat fuzzy in the background, not, not appreciatively sharp here. Focus point on the camera is right about in here on this. The other camera, a little better depth of field on it. Again, no blotchiness or discolorization in here. Third camera, it's sharp all the way from the front, all the way to the back. How far away is the back? <clears throat> About three feet, three and a half feet. How does it focus on more than one uh, depth? Autofocus, all, both cameras in autofocus mode. All the cameras in autofocus. No, no forced focusing. Right. 
Okay. It's the same camera on the left, middle and right. All the way down the columns. Okay. Now we're in taking macro pictures. First camera has no macro mode. Second camera has a macro mode, not too bad. I probably got a little too close on its macro mode on this one, so I probably hurt the resolution on that one. Third camera, nice and sharp. Flash on this camera even works in macro mode and doesn't blotch out the pictures. Here's a classic lens test. It doesn't look like much. Yeah, I know that. What we're looking for. Color rendition on this is pretty good. The lines in the border of the brick are straight. No lens distortion. That's what the test is meant to show. And the colorization is right. It's not as sharp as it should be. <coughs> Autofocus cameras have a real problem focusing on something which is multicolored and flat. There's no depth in there. They can't look at it. So we're trying to fool cameras here. Second camera, again, no distortion in the lens, nice and flat, color, it messed up real bad. On. Third camera, color is correct. Look at the brick lines on this one. They're not straight. There's pillowing, okay? They're bigger in the center than they are off to the edges. We'll talk about what causes that. Exposure control test, another one. Doesn't look like much of a test. How well can that camera handle a grayscale, the black and white? This camera obviously got rather fooled by it. It thinks it's a bright spot, right? <coughs> this camera also got fooled and its color is off. The other camera, right on. Dark object at a distance, backlit. Trying to fool the exposure system again. This camera didn't do too bad with it. Let's see if I can make it. There's a bright spot right here, and notice how the leaves have a haloing effect around them. If you put this, this picture in reverse image format, there's actually a big old white spot in here from the lens on this camera. This camera exposed off of the background. You can't see the leaves, you can't see the building. This camera, you can see the leaves, you can see the grass, you can see the building. It didn't react to the background photograph, to the background lighting at all. Macro close-up again, trying to show depth of field in a macro mode. It should be very off and focused back here, and they are. This was a little better than this one. This one again has no macro mode, but it didn't focus very well in the background either. Again, a little closer, same thing. Macro mode's better on this camera. This one's okay, this one doesn't have one. Now, let's come inside and test flash attachments. Very important for most people. One thing you can never find out about a camera is what's the watt seconds of the flash. Watt seconds tells you the power of that flash unit. General rule of thumb, most digital cameras shouldn't work over 10, 12 feet. A lot of them don't work over 6 or 8 feet. This is the one camera. Uh, <coughs> This one has an F2.8 lens on it, nice and fast. This one has an F8 lens, on, F6 lens on it. Let's look at this picture. You know, is there anything even there? There is when you get into it, you get to look. We'll, we'll show you later on. This one, it didn't do that. I'm oh, sorry, this is available light shot. It flies to the next one. This is the available light shot. That's no, no illumination, just what's coming into the room. Dark mahogany, red colored uh, entertainment center, black television set, lots of light reflecting over here to fool the sensors. Let's go down and look at the flash side of this thing. This camera dumped all of its light on one side. This one spread it out. This one spread it out to a fairly good distance, approximately 14 feet on this shot. It's hard to see here, it's easier to see on the monitor. There's lots of blue, green, and gray blotching this all over this photograph. <coughs> this photograph does not have as much artifacting in it as the other one does, and it's almost visible. And yeah, that ain't too bad of a photograph. You can do a little bit of editing on that one and you can recover that picture. And this is just a shot taken in a white room of a black object with a single incandescent light bulb overhead. Not too bad, a little dark. Lots of noise in this picture. 
The other camera, it did a real great job. It, it knows what white balance is, but it doesn't know what a tungsten light is. Now, that, all the, that is the worst of the three pictures I did take. I couldn't believe this when they came out of the camera. And this is the other camera over here. Pretty decent picture. Kick the flash out on the same test. That's not too bad of a shot. Again, color balance is off on that one. And that's the actual colors of what's there. That is a bright orange, a bright yellowish flashlight light. That's the color is right. Uh, before you guys think you need a fancy lab to do all this and special software, in case you couldn't guess, these are pictures from around my dad's house. <laughs> okay. So it's, just, it's just taking the same shot with three different cameras each time. You don't need to have a special lab, special color wheels, or anything fancy to do this. You can do it yourself. You just need to what, take the pictures of. Okay? Flat objects with no reflection. Objects with lines on them. High contrast objects, black and white backlit pictures. Those are the things which are going to separate the good cameras from the bad cameras. What are the cameras? Well, the one with the best features all around took the worst pictures. And we're going to show you how bad some of those pictures were when we get into the next section. The second oldest camera with the least amount of features did the second best. And the oldest one with the worst set of features you can find took the best pictures. Now, there's two reasons. It's actually a better camera. Two, I'm very familiar with it and I know how to use that camera. And that's what using your camera and taking pictures a lot of pictures is all about. Okay? You also didn't have so many features that it didn't confuse itself. Well, I don't care who you are and how well you know the Argus camera, you ain't going to take a good picture with that thing. I, I get confused with my camera. I'll show you some of the things. I, I didn't find the photo I wanted here, but I have focus control on my camera. Are you getting commission off of these tonight? I beg your pardon? Are you getting commission off of these tonight? No. <laughs> uh, and I blew a real great photograph. Although tips are appreciated. Barn, I, I confused my exposure lock with my focus lock. There you go. Picture of a, whole, of a sledgehammer sitting on its on the head. It's just that much of it just covered with ladybugs. Solid. Mm -hmm. The real night, the good light coming right in through a door. Perfect exposure. Only problem is the focus is on the back wall four feet away and the center mm -hmm. of the subject is blurry. Okay? Oh. Because I forgot which way my control was. Okay? The other cameras, it wouldn't have made any difference. Take picture, you know? well, my favorite ones are all the pictures of ghosts he kept taking. He kept telling me that his camera isn't working right and he's getting these bad, awful pictures. They got these white, blotchy stuff all over it. I watched him take a picture one day, and before he snaps the lens, he exhales in cold air. Yeah. And his breath comes around the camera like that. <laughs> this one, one of, the, one of the disadvantages. Why? Because where the lens is. Okay? Before we get out of the next section, let's go back up to this other one here. Hey, you always hold your breath. When we're talking yeah. about... I would have never thought of that. These cameras, okay? You notice the one camera takes pictures further away. It looks like they're further away. This camera, the reason its flash works so well when you're taking pictures of people, it's got an extremely wide angle lens on it. This thing has the equivalent of a 30 millimeter lens that would be on a 35 millimeter camera. The normal wide angle lens for a 35 millimeter camera is 35 millimeter. So this thing is great for taking indoor pictures because it covers a lot of room. You want to take a picture of scenery or something you can't get too close to. And I got a picture of a lizard here I can show you. He wouldn't, he wouldn't cooperate at all. It's just a little tiny spot because you can't get close enough to anything in this thing. Okay? So that's a, that's a good feature. But you get the, the ghosts that he's talking about. You get the hat. Okay? You gotta you gotta know. These cat this one's got the widest, the longest focal length <laughs> lens of all. It's equivalent, it's 46 millimeter. Uh, in a 35 format, normal 35 format, rates anywhere between 50 and 55 millimeters, also coming to about 52. So this is fairly close to what a 35 millimeter does. This one does a little bit different here. I think this one comes out, I figured it out, it's around 40, around 40 millimeter. So that's why this camera takes pictures further away, okay? And it, it has some advantage, it has some disadvantage. What are you going to use the camera for? And I can't afford one with a big zoom lens and interchangeable lenses to fit on these things like you can for the 35s. Uh, Nikon is the only manufacturer who is making a camera body with a digital back that will take your Nikon bayonet lenses at one and a half times the magnification of the lens. The back of the camera started at a thousand bucks. Okay? But you know, if you're serious and that's what you want, you know, that's what you've got to go for. Okay, batteries. These things consume batteries with a wild abandonment. When I was shooting a lot, I could consume two sets of batteries a week. 
I switched over to NICADs because they were rechargeable and they worked real well. You're going to do a lot of shooting, carry an extra set of batteries. It doesn't hurt to have a set of, of regular plain old alkali batteries along with you. They always work. If you're going to take a lot of pictures with this thing, you really need to go buy some metal, some nickel metal hydride batteries. It's really the only way to go. It costs you about 20 bucks per set of four with a charger. You'll pay for that in four or five sets of batteries. The metal hydride batteries have a real good feature, and that is once you get these things conditioned, you can just charge them when you need to, and they work. The old nickel cad batteries like I had, you had to make sure they were dead dead when you recharged them. If you didn't, they built up memory, and then it would only be good for half or a quarter, and they eventually got to the point where you couldn't get enough charge in the hard to take a picture with. Also, if you're going to take a lot of pictures, turn the flash off, particularly if your camera can take good available light shots. The flash unit kills batteries quicker than anything else does in the camera. Okay? If your camera doesn't take standard batteries and it takes a proprietary battery, good camera to avoid because you're going to be stuck buying those proprietary batteries from that manufacturer. And they're doing Taking better photos. Several things here. I'm not going to go through them all in great detail, but I do want to really harp on that first one because this is what you really need to do. Get your manual out and read it. It's the best tool that you have for learning how to take digital pictures. What can your camera do? This is the one for the Olympus camera. It's nice. It comes in three languages. You can't find half of what you want in it, which is what the problem is. Camera manuals are even worse than computer manuals, if that's possible. But they have managed. This is up in the very front part of the book on the manual. It's an extremely important picture. You wouldn't know it to recognize it here. They don't tell you that it is. But what's important are these little lines here. And no place in this manual are they really talked about, which is absolutely amazing. The first one here are the focus control lines in this camera. The vertical lines are the exposure control lines. So I can control what that camera does. You saw no problem with backlit pictures. Why? I made sure those vertical lines were down on the right spot of the picture when I took it. If I wanted to focus it on a specific area, I would set these on it, push the shutter down halfway and hold it, and it's locked. That's what I should have done when I took the picture of the thing. I should have locked that exposure there. I did. I locked it this way instead of that one. And I blew my picture. <laughs> these are my top window that tells me all the things the camera can do. It's got buttons so darn close together and so much information up in that window, you don't have a clue what this thing is doing. But if you've got big fingers, you can't get them. <laughs> it's hard to use. They're talking here about the autofocusing fiction. You know, what to do if you're taking horizontal and vertical pictures and what you're doing if there's sun in you. There's no place they tell you you can lock that exposure down on that camera. That focus down. Yeah. Wonderful. Here's the section on exposure compensation. They tell you that you can bump this thing up and down a half a stop. A half a stop of photography is a waste of time. It moves a full stop, it moves it all. It's great. You can do all this and play around with it. But they don't tell you that I can walk up to you, put that camera up to your face, press that thing down halfway, lock the focus of the exposure on her, step back here and take a picture. I don't care if she's backlit or what. The exposure is going to be off of her face, which is what you want to do. They don't tell you that here. The only reference to where you can find out something about this is buried down in here where they talk about the black light correction marks in the camera. So, you know, it's reading the manual and figuring out what it's trying to tell you and using that camera. Even if you take 30 or 40 pictures of the same subject, learn what's going on and what it's doing. If it's got any kind of control on it whatsoever, very, very important. And incidentally, here's the only place where you'll ever find anything about what the flash attachment will do. Mm. Ah. Only place in the main. Okay, we can go through some of these tips here. Uh, these are specific things dealing with various of the types of subjects. And I'm just going to cover a couple of them. We'll hit the ten main tips. Uh, I see we got a picture problem. Some more editing. Move in close. Get as close as you can. Fill your frame up. Digital cameras undershoot. 
the viewfinders undershoot, the cameras overshoot. What that means is the viewfinder shows you less than what's actually there to make sure that you get your picture. All cameras do that because they don't want you to miss anything. My Olympus undershoots about 25%. Wow. Yeah, way, way too much. 10% is a lot better. So you, if I got a picture of four people, I only need to get three of them in the viewfinder. I know I got the fourth one. <laughs> That's how bad off the camera is. Yeah. Pardon, I have one that see the viewfinder, but it's in the pictures. I have one that does the opposite. That's not desirable. Because <laughs> <laughs> that means you missed things. <laughs> it, it, it sees more than that. The viewfinder sees more than you ever will in the picture. There's the other what side. What kind is that? Argus. <laughs> We're getting a trend here, aren't yes, we? Yeah. Yeah. Funny thing is, Argus was a very good camera manufacturer in the 50s and 60s. Uh, made excellent 35 millimeter cameras to okay. great pictures. What happened? <laughs> Who owns them now? Who knows? Do you, <laughs> remember, do you remember when Harley Davidson became part of uh, uh, the He's bowling been, people, pen yeah. people maker? Same sort of situation. Yeah. They talk about using a tripod, anticipate the moment. <coughs> when is the actual picture going to take place? If it's something you're following an action picture, you pan the camera and press the button. Works real good with the Argus camera. Works real good with the box camera. Don't try it with my camera. Why? My camera likes white balance. It takes two pictures. It takes a white balance to make sure it's got it right. Then it takes the picture. I have no idea when that thing's going to go off. It's just <laughs> to tell. Okay? Makes, it makes any type of action photography almost impossible with that camera. It takes good pictures. What are its limits? Okay? White balance could be a very good thing. I don't get a lot of pictures that are off color if I'm within the range of the camera. I don't have the photos on here. White balance can be a very bad thing. If the hue or the saturation is important to the composition of the subject. Set the scene. We're up at Pier Marquette Park. We're walking through the woods on one of the ridge trails. Pictures of some logs that were laid down and we're in heavy forest overcast cover. We had a definite yellow-green cast to the light with the green moss that made the picture. What did my camera do? White balance, no problem. What's it look like? Nothing that we saw. I mean, the color balance is right, but the picture's no good. We had another picture. Uh, we were in a very yellow atmosphere, almost the color of that marker there with the leaves underneath the canopy, shooting the log cabin out there. Nope, said white balance. Picture looks great. It's not the picture we saw. The mood was set by that yellow tone, and it just took it all out of there. So it's good and it's bad. No way to turn it off. Unfortunately, you're able to that off. Using the meter, using your monitor, look through your monitor if you've got a particular problem or you've got time to take that picture. If you're close on framing, look at your monitor. Don't work with your viewfinder. If you're working in close, again, might work a lot better with your viewfinder. Because one of the problems when you get into macro mode is which way am I on this picture? This way, that way, up, down makes a big difference in that thing. Looking through here, I know which way I am because the focus gets more critical as you get in close. Your depth of field, how far it sees, the closer you are, gets less. The wider open your lens is, the less your depth of field becomes. <coughs> That's conventional photography. That's not new photography. Yeah, shoot first with the erase later. Very, very, <laughs> a very good rule of thumb. Okay? It doesn't cost you much to take the digital pictures. Just keep taking them. If you're short on storage space, weed out the ones you want, or go to another mode. My camera will take 120 pictures on an 8-meg card. If I'm shooting 640 by 480, it shoots 40 pictures at uh, 128 by 768, whatever it is. Okay? Keep it on low mode, get the shot you want, kick it, kick it into the high-quality mode, take the picture. So I can get a lot of pictures on that little flash card that way. Let's save the Monica Lewinsky. Hmm? I said, but save the Monica Lewinsky shot. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to bore you with flowers. Open shade is an interesting area of taking pictures. This is one that most amateurs avoid or don't recognize the potential of it. Taking pictures outside of people is very difficult. If you get them in the morning sun with the sun behind your back, there's a lot of glare on their face. You can't wash that out with a flash attachment with a fill flash. If you get them turned sideways, they got shadows across their face. 
If you turn them around backwards, their faces in shadow and your camera's fooled by the exposure. Go over to the north side of the big building, underneath the big tree. You got plenty of light. Take your picture. It mutes out all the tones. Turn your flash attachment on. Because that way you'll control the direction of the light. It'll highlight their facial tones and features, and you get a good picture. So, so working in shade, working in shadow is very good. With any type of point and shoot camera, make absolutely sure that you don't get too much background light coming through it unless your camera has some way, spot, we call it spot meter focus, where you can lock it on that person's face. Because otherwise it's going to fool your camera and you're not going to get what you think you're taking the picture. Actually, Adobe Photoshop, one of its new plugins in the latest version, will smart up to figure out what's in the foreground, what's in the background, and dynamically change exposure and the focus on that. So if you do some of these things by accident, if you feel like spending 500 bucks for Adobe Photoshop or $700 for it, you can correct it afterwards. Oh. And three or four hours learning how yeah. to much cheaper, to, much cheaper to learn how to do it to, right to start with. The demon scene picture, we've all seen these, right? <laughs> I'll let you go through this. Red eye is very difficult to control with these cameras, and it don't matter which one of these I picked up, they all got the same problem. The problem is, the closer this is to the axle of the lens, the worse the red eye problem is going to become. If you've seen professional cameras, they've always got a separate flash attachment, or they got the flash attachment over to the side and up high. No red eye. The red comes from your retina of your eye. The, cam the flash is going in and bouncing off of that. The camera lens is in line with that. It picks that up. If your camera has red eye reduction, that helps. What does it do? It fools your eye. It takes two pictures. Okay. It flashes, it takes one picture, it takes two flashes. Shoots the flash the first time, your eyes say, whoops, that's a lot of light. Dial, takes your pupils down in size, that way I can't see back into your eye as well. But then it flashes again, takes a picture. You don't have a good flash attachment, it loses part of the power on the first shot, and you don't have as much for the second shot. So if it's a distant shot, you don't get a good picture. But that's one way around the picture. The other way is to have your subject not look directly into the lens of the camera, look a little below it or a little off to the side of it. You overdo that, the pictures don't look too good. But this will go through and talk to you about how you can work on this and reduce it to some of the things that you can go through and take care of this properly. Okay? Again, much better to try to eliminate it than try to fix it, although most of the software packages are pretty good at fixing red eye. That's one thing that you seem to have done pretty good. If you want to go into something here and take a look, I have the part of the ZETV's new photo book and CD on here that they have out on their website. You can go out and look at this and take you through on how to take pictures of sunsets and we'll come down and show you some more on this later. Okay. Let's talk about making pictures now. We've talked about taking pictures. That's the first part. Making pictures. This is what we used to do in the dark. We'd turn out the lights and turn on the red lights. And we started to improve pictures. We could print pictures. That was fine. We got a battery, we could burn it in, we could dodge it, we could give it more light, less light, we could control the exposure on the paper, we could control how long we developed it. If we had poly contrast paper, we could determine the hardness of the image or the softness of the image to take care of overexposed and underexposed pictures. If we're doing color, we had wheels, we could slide in to change the color balance of the things and all that stuff. The good news now is you guys are the color labs. Okay? That job's all yours with the digital camera. Okay? Always better to take a good picture than it is to try to make a good picture. Even in the dark room when we had really bad pictures, we had really bad pictures when we were done, they were just better bad pictures. You're never going to make a good picture, a bad picture, a good picture. It just doesn't work that way. Comparative results. Let's see what we've done here. We took a bad picture. And we played around with it in a whole bunch of software packages. Okay? This is a shot on the second floor of a building. It's about 250, 300 feet long. It's taken at night. The lights are mercury vapor lights, so we got a bad color correction problem. Up in the top, yeah, you got a flash attachment. You know, remember, it's good for 10 feet, and that ain't much good. Dark gray floors, and that's the picture. I played with this picture in almost every package you can think of, and I played with it for several years trying to get a decent shot out of it. It's a good, bad picture to work with. Okay. <clears throat> Photo Deluxe, this is the Adobe Simple Package. There it is loaded into it. This is the application of the autocorrect feature. Better. Not 
not great. Still muddy, still blotchy. No shadow detail down here. This is gray, this is not blue. This is yellow, not green. Played around with it a little bit in the manual mode. We went in, we changed the brightness and the contrast settings in here, and you can see we can improve that fairly good. Simple to use, easy package, German comes free with your camera. Okay? You can do some pretty decent things with it. And that's just the final shot over there after manually adjusting. Manual adjustment is certainly better than the automatic adjustment. Smart draw. One of the shareware packages that's out there. What's unique about this package is the way it works. You click on something that gives you a nine square patch to play with. Then you pick what's good, what's bad, it kind of moves you through it, so it's relatively simple to work with. My scanner program works like this. I like it very well, and it works very well for my scanner program. It doesn't work very well, unfortunately, on very bad pictures. Okay? <laughs> Another program, IR friend view. I do is the original program name. It has a nice feature when it comes up. We're going to show you this program in great detail. Uh, gives you this, you can enhance, you can move these slider bars down here, you can adjust the contrast. And that's what we did here, this is neutral. We've increased the brightness on this one, we've increased the contrast, and we dumped the gamma setting, which is the ratio of red, green, and blue, trying to improve it. And that's the best we got out of it. Again, manually adjusting, it's not very good in terms of overall quality. We did pick up some shadow detail down in here. Yeah, those chairs are that stupid color. But we still have a great tone from that. Check. What does that gamma? Gamma affects the overall ratio of the red, green, and blue of the picture. And we get down to the Photoshop one, I'll very, very easily be able to show you the effects of that. <coughs> Here are two other packages. One is Microsoft's Photo Editor in manual mode. Uh, where we, that's the best we can do with it. And, you know, it ain't any better than the cheap package was this for free. And here is a program called iCorrect, uh, one that I use. It has some nice features in it. You have the side-by-side -side view. You can select black points and white points and kind of mess around with it without getting into a lot of detail. Again, not real great either. Pull out the big daddy here. Here's Photoshop 7. This is the one that everybody says is the absolute best. Yeah. Um, it is an A. There's a picture loaded. This is the result of its best automatic correction features that Photoshop has to offer. Probably the worst of the $29 packages in auto mode, okay? Well, let's start playing with it in manual mode. Okay. I played with this just to do this demo about 30 minutes to get this far with this picture, okay? And I have a relatively good idea what I'm doing in Photoshop doing these kinds of things. The learning curve on Photoshop is like climbing Mount Everest. Very hard to use package. It has wonderful help screens. It just missed a few points. They never tell you where to start. So you never can find out where the hell you're supposed to start on the menus to get down to where they're talking about. Okay? So it makes it a little difficult. Also, the, the terminology that's used is not very good and hard to follow. <clears throat> Here we change the cues. We messed around with the hues. The hue control. Notice we were able to get this more to a blue-gray and this more to a natural color than what we could with the other packages. The other good thing about Photoshop is, if you learn it is, you do one thing and you think you would kept, keep that image and then you could move on to the next, right? No. you got to save it. Saving a picture in Photoshop is six to eight clicks. Then you get to, sometimes you even have to load it back in again and then come at it into the other shot. It'll do great and wonderful things but it's just not very user friendly. We put it over here and we mess with the red, green, blue curve that you asked about on that photograph. This curve normally runs straight and we bump this curve up this way and you can see that we were able to change these colors and more importantly, we were able to clear up this background mid-tone range by doing that with this photograph. Okay? So yes, we were able to get a lot better picture down here. It's still got its problems up here, but if this was an important photograph and you were trying to get something out of it, okay, you, you could just say this is acceptable. Okay? It's real easy to fix good pictures. It's real easy to fix ones that are just a little bit off. And the ones that are real dogs, it's real hard to work with. So 
that's always a good control. Okay, one of my favorite programs, Digital Camera Enhancer. It's on this disc. It's completely free. You want to fix this picture? You got your presets right. It's one click. If you don't know your presets, it's three slider bars and it's fixed. Okay? Here it is loaded in. It's your side-by-side -side screen. We'll just forget about that one. It comes up and you just move these bars around. I, I increased the mid-range tone. I enhanced details in this. I kicked up the auto balance control. I left the noise setting alone on this particular picture. We'll show you that later. And that is good. Better than Photoshop. Are those live? Uh, yes. When you move yes. It changes yeah. The picture, you don't mm -hmm. Instantly. No, no, no preview. No click back. Just right there. Bang. Okay. Free program on the disc. Company offers three other products. One called ColorCast. It fixes color problems like that. Another one called Clear Skin. Fixes skin tone problems and problems with eye shadows and deep eye sockets. Just in a flash. Huh. What, what's that one called? The digital camera enhancement. It's on the, on the disc and we, we get better at it. How bad of a picture can this program mess with? Okay. Let's take the ones that were real fun from the Argus camera, okay? We saw this one. This is the worst one. We played with this thing. I won't go through each one of the steps here doing things. We did denoise this picture all the way. And notice the change that we got from here to here. We came down and we, we changed the tone settings on this one. And we went from that picture there to that picture there. Okay? Again, it's got a lot of artifacting in here and a lot of noise in here. But if that was a good picture that you either got off a scanner or your camera or something, something you couldn't take again or a relative who died, you have recovered this thing, this photograph. Okay? You have to save between the steps? No. These bars are live. You make a change, it shows on the picture. You save this by clicking on the save screen. We have a detailed step-by-step -step tutorial on this. Okay. The only thing I want to really drive home out of all of this thing is no one package does everything. You'll also notice we didn't show you how to print out any of these programs, and there's a darn good reason for that. <laughs> because each have strengths and weaknesses. No program does everything. No program does everything well. So your toolkit's going to need several software packages to get the most out of your pictures. Not out of your good pictures. They're not much of a problem. You can generally run them through something through like the digital enhancement program, and they'll straighten out 90% of the camera pictures. How many looked at the website, uh, the newsletter this month, and went through and looked at the Christmas card pictures in there, the Christmas party pictures in there, okay? Those are all enhanced, except for the one with the prizes I gave you both before and after. Okay? Each one of those was bumped a little bit to make those pictures good. Very simple. Just, I ran, they ran through iCorrect, and iCorrect has a batch feature. You just turn it loose and just go, it's finished. Okay? The pay version of Digital Enhancer does that too. You go through, you set one, get your presets right, you say, from here to here, do them all, thank you, goodbye, I'm done. Okay? You can do that with Photoshop too. See? You get the files, you identify what you want done, you write a script file, and you execute it. Mm -hmm. Another hour and a half or two. Okay? It's a good program. We're going to use it for some of the detailed editing. Uh, it'll do things you won't believe. But it's just not very friendly. I'll give you a, a trick that I use, because I'm a horrible photographer and I have almost no eye for color, as my dad can well testify. The Argus camera looks good to me. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the tricks I do if I'm taking a picture, especially an indoor picture where I have issues with white balance, is I'll take a, just a cheap paper plate, the cheapest paper plate I can buy, right? I have a whole stack in the, in, the, in the closet. And I'll put it somewhere down in the frame away from what I really want to take the picture of. So now I have a known color in that photograph that I know is white. So when I'm back processing these things, these different enhancers, some of them have autocorrect features. You can tell that's white, and it'll adjust everything else to the entire camera. I take decent pictures that way, because I can sit there and spend... 20 minutes messing with gamma and contrasting and everything else, and to me it looked just as screwed up as I started. But if it's white down there, I can tell it, that's white, and it'll go through and do the rest. Have you ever tried using a gray card? Hmm? Have you ever no. tried using a gray card? No, yeah. I've not. Um, you, can, you can do the same thing with like construction paper. Go, go, if you want to do like the reds and the greens and the blues really well, okay. get some construction paper, make a, just a, you know, take the red, green, blue, put it on there, and take the same type of picture. You do lose some of your frame when you do that, but it gives you a known point of color reference to work with. We should take pictures. 
pro photographers have a grayscale card. Mm -hmm. Take a black and white, you sit that down the bottom of the picture. That's it. The lab knows that's the balance. So they set your picture back. We did color. We had the same thing. We had a color scale card. RG, the, the spectrum card's down there. You should put that down in the photo. They used to straighten them out. Color balance you to that point. True case. My grandfather was a taxidermist part-time. He used to stuff the weird things. Okay? <laughs> we had two Mexican heel monsters sent in by the Mexico City Zoo. Okay? They're a different color than the American heel monster. So the problem was he had to stuff these things, and when you stuff it, when you get a reptile and you process it, they lose all their color. So these things were kind of grayish, black. And now what color do we paint them? Okay? Couldn't find anything in all the books about these things because they're kind of rare. This was probably 40 years ago. So what we did is we wrote down and asked the curator of the zoo, can he send us back some pictures of some live ones? Which he did. He had two of them held up by the tail. We got them processed and printed he sprayed one of them and sent it down. He said, that's not what they look like. Matched the photograph just perfect. So what I did is I sent him down a color card. He says, take the picture one more time. Put the color card in the picture. Hold it in one hand, a lizard in the other hand, right? Got him back, sent him into a custom lab. Says, here you go. Right out. Okay? Pros use those tools. You don't know what the reference is. I can tell you it's green. I can tell you it's light green. You know, I can tell you it's a specific color of green. You think that is, and what I think that is, is two different things. And then you part of the color wheel, when you, print, when you print that on your printer, your printer adds another layer of distortion to that whole color scheme. So if you print the color wheel out with the photo, hold your color wheel up next to it, and you can go, aha, this screen is not right. It looks right on the screen, but it's not right on the printer. You can go back and adjust that again to make up for it. The last time I looked at the color card, you could buy one for about 250 bucks. Walmart, pack of color construction paper. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't send them out commercial. Right. Two programs you want to kind of run through here and some degree of uh, speed for you and a little bit on printing and then we'll come back to what we've got. Well, I mean, it One of my favorite programs is Infraview. It's on here. We use it all the time. We use it for everything. And this is probably the easiest little program you're ever going to get for free. It's been on all of our utility disks. It's probably one of the first things to run your, your photos through. Uh, it'll flip them left or right. They come up on the screen. Your camera's got them which way. Hit the right, the R button or the L button. It just flips them around. Hit the F button. It flips them this way. Anything you want. Crop a part of them out. Change the colors out of them. Enhance the colors. Change the size. Change the resolution. Set transparency. Make a slideshow. Apply filters. The whole nine yards. All free. I'm not going to go through how to install it and how this, but I will take it. It's a real quick view on how to use it. Okay? Will it take a, make a positive into a negative? It sure will. Really? It'll make black and white colors out of your things. It'll make art pictures out of them. Uh, can talk, it'll do all that kind of stuff. And how do it's I It's on a this? utility disk, okay. version 3.5. Also, when you install it, it's not on the utility disk. It's on this disk. There's another thing out there called additional plugins. By all means, install your additional plugins. Then if you click on a flash demonstration that you've got on your disk, you can never figure out how to show those darn things. They only come off the website. It takes care of all that problem. It just loads them up and plays them. Wait a minute. Is it, is it on the new utilities disk or the old utilities? Both. Both. 375 or 370 is on the yeah. new one, and 330, I think, is on the first one. It'll also be available on this CD. 375 is on this CD with the plug -in. Right, but this CD won't be released until the next meeting. Right. Okay. You pop on it, of the icon, it comes up here, you click on the file. Uh, this little thing over here, it gives you a drop-down menu where you can pick your pictures, go pick your picture, and you start to pick your pictures in here with a single click. It shows them to you down here as a preview, so you can find where they are. Click on or click open, pops up your, your photograph over here. You can then start applying things to your film, to your photograph. You can, I don't know what I did here first, I kind of lost track, okay. What we did is we opened up the enhancer, we clicked on image over here, we came down, and there's a thing here called enhance, we clicked on enhance, it pops up this screen here, you got the slider bars down here, and you can start playing with this image. To the extent you can play with them any way you want, and it's instantaneous. Always move them to the maximum so you know what you're doing. You can see what, what it really does to the picture. And this is where we move the gamma. The red green ratio all the way over. We move it all the way the opposite way. Before coming to a point where we like it, 
Instead of setting it 1.0, we set it at 0.74. And we went through, we said, okay, we want to save it. You, what we do is save, we apply it to the whole image and then give you the whole image in the background instead of just a little picture. You can come back and you can play with it some more. You can adjust the brightness of the contrast. You can also manually adjust each of the individual levels. The nice part about this program is it doesn't save anything. When it does do the save, it'll always ask you if you want to replace the picture which is there or if you want to rename it. So you don't have to worry about overwriting your, your photographs. Photoshop doesn't give you a warning. That's the digital enhancer. No, this one here is uh, interview. Okay. Digital enhancer is the next one. They work similar, but this one has a lot more uh, range. Get your picture, you can come in, you can crop your picture, draw it any way you want. You can cut that down, you can apply filters to it. Here we get a, a negative on the Thank color you. that you're talking about. Okay. You see my demo? <laughs> uh, I can't do all these things. Okay. Here we went through and we applied a, a filter called Sharpen. Most of the programs have it. Sharpen essentially comes in and does an interpolation on your picture and, and gets out some of the pixel range brings them down so there's more contrast between the pixels so it makes it look sharper to the eye. Word of warning, only sharpen a picture one time. Sharpen over, things start to happen. I didn't save it, but I had my picture of my lizard. I'll remember that for the Photoshop demo where I kept sharpening in and sharpening in and sharpening and ended up looking like a black something laying there on the sidewalk. It wasn't a lizard anymore. Okay? Uh, more capabilities within this program. Uh, we did a crop. You can cut through and you can change the palette. You can change the individual ratios on things. You can go black or white. You can open up a whole range of filters, plugins and filters, regular filters. You can go through and you can apply those filters like we're doing here one at a time. You can get to this and look at that in more detail. You do, with the, you can do anything you want to do with that picture. And you can print it. You can make a slideshow out of it. You can do, you see where mine is, real handy. I'm sorry, we got a question from back here. It'll, oh, well, he'd have to go back. It'll make thumbnails, it'll do slideshows. It has a batch feature where you can process a whole bunch of files at one time once you get one set, real nice. It'll do your acquiring. You can tell what Twain source you want to come from. You want to come from your camera, you want to come from your scanner, select it. It'll bring in files. You don't need to load up all your camera software and all that other neatsy stuff. Uh, it's, it's just got so many features that it's just, you know, and it's free. It's probably one of the best free pieces of software I have seen. And it doesn't crash unless you feed it a 20 megapixel photo. It doesn't work. It will take tens. Remember the big banner that we had? The old banners that we had? That's a 10 megabyte pixel. We worked on it in this one, straighten out the colors. Okay? And we can take this one. One last thing with the batch feature you can do batch resize. <clears throat> I tend to take all my pictures at their maximum resolution. Well, that makes really big files, but I'm going to keep them that way on my hard drive because I want to have them for posterity. Well, all my friends that want me to email them to them, you know, the party we had last week, mm. they don't want these huge files. In fact, when you send them to them, they complain they can't see everything because, you know, someone's eyeballs is this big in their email and they don't understand you can zoom that down. Or it won't fit through your email because it's a five day limit. Right. So I always take myself through iView on a batch resize and chop it down to 640 by 480 or 375 by 352, some standard size like that. 72 DPI resolution. Yes, yeah, so, right. So they don't get the all right. They don't get the whole image, but they didn't really care. You know, they, they can see the can of Bud Light in their hand as well as you know, a, a full size or a small size. And now the images are a lot smaller, so I'll just go through a batch, do a batch process, stick them in their own in their own directory, which I will let you do. Zip that directory and email it to them. Say, here are the pictures from the party last night, and now it's a half a meg file instead of a 20 meg file. And that's part of the presentation number three. Okay, <clears throat> this goes about how to install the digital enhancer program. It's very straightforward down through this point. It's just a matter of yes or no. Find the program, click on setup. It pops up like this in these two views. Load, click on load, bring your picture in. Give you a little menu, you select your picture. Once you've selected your picture, it pops it up. These sliders are active. Move them around, do whatever you want with them. When you get to the point where you're going to click on the save button up here, it gives you this menu over here so you can name it or rename it or change whatever you want. Put your name down here. When you click on save, it brings up this screen over here, another screen where it lets you change the resolution. So if you want, you can reduce the resolution and the size of the image. And then there's your finished picture. 
And it's just that fast and easy. So why am I paying the school all that money to teach me the other? Because you'll be able to do a whole heck of a lot more with Photoshop. Well, you'll I also be able to create, if you have artistic talent, mm -hmm. you can actually make drawings and paintings and pictures and everything in Photoshop. It's kind of like killing ants with a sledgehammer. Okay? okay. But, well, For most photo editing tasks. Well, I can show you some pictures that we did in the second or third part of the demo third. works. They're pictures of my house, and I, went, I was doing a remodeling project. I wanted to see what it looked like with a different sidewalk in front. At the I took a picture of the house without the sidewalk. The whole sidewalk is ripped out. There's shovels all over the place. There's construction debris all over there. And I have a picture that I just took, basically a Photoshop-like program, and added a sidewalk with the appropriate concrete tone to it and everything yeah. with that. And How about a deck that was built before the picture, before the and sent into the for the building permits of the finished project? Before we had even torn down the old. Thing. That would have taken a lot less time than me drawing it all up, wouldn't it? <laughs> Especially by me, hand. I can't draw a straight line. Yeah. Okay. But well, I actually have a picture of the deck that's done. Nobody can without a ruler. Well, see, that's there, there's some, like programs like Photoshop. You know, how to picture the house at an angle. Right. Well, that means the deck had to be orthoscopic in there, right? Perspective yeah. drawing. Yeah. Exactly. So I snapped a line yeah. along the siding of the house, yeah. extended out to make the deck, right? So I could draw mm -hmm. the deck within that frame and get the scale right for the perspective mm -hmm. drawing. Photoshop lets you do things like that. Okay. It also lets you do things like use these red eye corrections and other things like that. But again, it's you know atomic weaponry for ants. <laughs> Leonard, you said something about the plugins for yeah. IR Frame View. Can it's, you it's get them from the main site? Or? No, they'll come right off our disk here. Or you can get them from their site too. It's a little hard to find them. It's down towards the bottom. Oh, it's just okay. one little file you load. And it loads a bunch of other plugins that let it work with different formats. The best thing it lets it do with it, it actually lets it play flash automations. And you yeah. saw the Christmas disc. We had these yeah. Christmas cards. Some of them worked automatically because they were in flash. I have flash already. Okay. So I don't. Know. Okay. So you save them as a projector. Then it's a standalone program. But if they don't save it as a projector, they save it as a protected file that is an FWS extension, and nothing will read it. Nothing will edit it. So if I got them on my drive, and they, the nice part is when you play flash automation from the website, they put them on your hard drive and they remain there forever. <laughs> and some of those things are 15, 16 megabytes. Okay? So you can load up a hard drive. You, can't, you don't know what they are. You can't get rid of them. You can't use them. Well, with this tool, you go click on them, and it'll tell you what they are. It'll play them. You can see them. If you click on them in Flash, it tells you, would you like to load the Flash plugin? But you can load it, but it still won't open the picture. Mm -hmm. If you had the Flash viewer, then you can go in and do a file load and play. You can do it that way. But with this, you just click on them. They're yours. Do whatever you want with them. Yes. You uh, on the previous screen, you sized the picture. Is that a one-time option? I nope. was in a different program. And nope. I sized my picture and saved it. Then I needed to make it smaller to post it on the internet. And I probably sat there for three hours trying to get that resize window back up, and I couldn't get. It. <coughs> Let's take that, let's do a resize. Nice part on this is this is what our size is here. We can keep the aspect ratio of the picture. Let's take that and make that 320. It automatically changes the next size for us. There's our picture. We can save that. So you've got to go in somewhere else. You don't get that one screen that you get. No, it's on a different feature. I can save this. If I want, I can come back and I can say, okay, let's resize this again. <laughs> We're going to make this into a thumbnail. And 125. I finally was able to get that screen, but I could never get that one where it asked you to be one of these sizes. I mean, it's, it's just that quick with that program to do those kinds of things. I make a lot of thumbnail tables. You see them in, you see them in all these presentations. That's a program called Thumbs Plus, which we'll show you later, that does all this stuff. If you miss one, there's no way in Thumbs Plus to add one. You get to go back and go through their eight or nine step menu build program again. What do I do? I just click on the thing, say, add another column. I pop up. I view programs. And I know what size my thumbnail was. Take this picture, make a thumbnail out of it. Name it for the thumbnail, pop it in there, do the manual link, and I'm done. Rather than running back through, deleting all the thumbnail files, deleting the index files, rebuild the whole thing over again with one or two pictures added. It's just a fast, easy, simple way to do it. Uh, printing. You can print out an IU. Uh, it's a good program. Most photo printing problems or software problems are 
If you just want to print one picture, it's not too bad. Then you end up with these nice 8 by 10 sheets of paper that cost you 50 cents if you got <laughs> all jiggy jaggies cut out of them, and now what do I do with the rest of this? I sure don't want to throw it away, right? Get a program like this, Photoshop. This, this one's an HP Smart Suite. It comes with all the HP printers. And I don't know where it's going to take us. separate from a regular printer? Yeah. If you're very serious about it, yes, and I'll tell you why. The best photo printer in the consumer market is Epson printers. Epson printers do a very good job on making photographs. They can't print on regular paper worth the damn. They saturate the paper, they drown the paper. Uh, it bleeds through, they're just horrible. HP's do a much better job on that, and most all the other printers do too. Uh, so if you're real serious, yeah, you want one, one to handle that. Uh, personally, I, <coughs> I work with just the HP and don't worry about it. I've had both printers. My latest thought, I was all geared up to buy a photo printer, and what scares me is the expense of the print cartridges. What brand printer are you looking at? I've looked at several on HP, I think. And, uh, Whatever you do, stay away from Lexmark. I mean, they're, they're nice, cheap printers, but you'll, you'll go bank or buy a print. print. Right. The last revelation I had, I don't know how intelligent it was, but uh, I checked into putting your uh, photo on a lobby mm -hmm. and take it and get it printed for 20 cents a piece. Mm -hmm. And I had to print a whole lot of photos for it. <coughs> Yeah, the, the only problem with that is you're relying on whoever does that printout for you to, to spot the spot the color corrections and what things that need to be fixed. And as you'll see, when you print something, it doesn't always look like what you get on the screen. The colors tend to get shifted slightly. So you can give that guy, you know, your disc in 20 cents, and he comes back and says, this is what I have on the screen. You go back home, <coughs> adjust it, give it to him again, and well, it's a little closer. You go back home, you adjust it, and, you know, you're going to burn up a lot more of the gas going to and from the guy in frustration. So, so they don't do as good a job with digital as they do with the film? No, again, they have the same issues when they go to print them out. They, they're not doing, it's not a film process, it's not a chemical process of development. It's a, an inking process, just like they have at home. They, they just happen to have a bigger printer, and you could argue uh, maybe a little more accurate printer, but it's still the same process you go through with your home machine. Okay. This program, you can bring up a bunch of pictures, you can manage your pictures, and what you can do is you can fill up a whole sheet. Various in some different ways gives you the ability to do this thing. You also have some resizing ability in here when you pick your options. And once you get something loaded uh, and you, you put your pictures into it, you know, right. you want two of that one, no particular problem. When you, you can manage an album and you can just do a straight print, there's another feature in here. Where is it? Where it'll let you do some, some basic uh, slider type editing. On uh, here, generally brightness and contrast and color control. That's a real nice, simple, easy way to print <coughs> pictures and, and make more than one. If you just got to make one, you, know, you can print it out of almost anything will work relatively well. You got to make lots of one print, or you want to maximize your paper. You need to get a printing program. Okay, and that's kind of the point I want to make out of that. <coughs> okay, again, for you also prints. Uh, put a file in it. You want to do a print, file, print, you can, you can edit. Nice choices, it lets you have a, a selection of printers, and you know, I have a rather wide selection of printers available to me. <laughs> then it comes up, and I can change my side, I can change the fit, I can change what I want, I can customize it, I can flip it, I can put it landscape, or I can put it portrait, I can do anything I want with it. It's nice for one. Got a bunch to print? No, it's not two. Are you going to cover archival links and archival papers and things like that Great. in the next demo three? Demo three. Okay. Since we're running a little short on time here, I'm just going to tell you these other links and things are down here. And you can go off and check these things out on your own. That's all I'm going to say about them. I'm also going to say that Windows XP has some built-in features that are in, X, in the XP that you can use yourself. There's also a bunch of enhancements out on the Windows site out there. 
for frames and downloads and other software and updates to media player and so on, and that's all downloaded and on the CD. And that's all available from there. What I want to cover is what's on here. This program here is not on here. It's the new Adobe Photo Album. Adobe is taking Photoshop 7 and making a consumer version out of it and has promised that it's going to be easy to use. All of the reviews I've read on it say this is going to be great. It's supposed to be out next month, and hopefully we will have a copy we can demo to see whether it is. Adobe Photo Deluxe, we've talked about that. That's out here. It's kind of what came, from, came with three cameras. We've talked about that one. We've showed you Digital Enhancer, showed you the kinds of things that it's capable of doing. You want more about the free version, you click here. You want to find out about the pay version. There's their pay version and what it does. I think this is a whole whopping 20 to 30 bucks, if I remember. Right? It's not too terribly expensive. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is, and this is on the disc, is the free version of their clear skin program out here that will clarify things and straighten things up. Where they're showing you what can go in and what it's capable of doing in terms of straightening out blemishes and clearing up problems. Their color fast program is great. Some cameras do not do a good balance. Canon has a particular problem. Uh, my camera likes to overexpose pictures a little bit, so they, they go up a little bit dark uh, on it. I need to bump them about 20%, which is why I adjust. But this is what color cast can do. If your camera produces, constantly produces things with a blue, red, green, or a cast in one thing, you set the defaults on and you just run through that program, and it just straightens them out. Buy the pay version, and you can give them the whole damn directory. It'll straighten them all out in one shot. HP Photo Smart, we just showed you. Photo Plus is an interesting little program. It's more geared to, towards the web developer, uh, but it has the abilities to make changes, and it's real nice, easy to use. Uh, free version is on this disk, and we'll go through and talk about what it's capable of doing. It works nice on retouching and restoring things. Okay. Image Expert is another program, the trial version is on here. Smart Draw is on here. I wasn't overly impressed with its program when I went and used it. But what's nice about it is they have a real nice little demo, a little, uh, it's a text HTML based presentation on editing photos and how to do it, which you'll see in the next presentation. We've been through the IRU program, so we won't go through that. And lastly, a whole series of programs on I correct and what I correct is capable of doing. And they, these are their free versions of their programs. These are all time limited. I correct works the same way as the uh, others do. It's uh, oh, come on. These are the tools which I routinely have available to use. You notice there was more than one. It comes up, gives you some help screen to load a picture, you get the left and the right. The nice thing about it is, Chuck was talking about the paper plate. I can come in here and say, okay, this is white. I come over to my picture and I click on this is white. I can select five white points, five black points. It's a balance this picture according to what I've told you. Okay? Their in-camera programs work with colors the same way. Uh, simple to use, this camera, this is a $20 camera. Okay? And that is what I want to cover in this. I'm finished. We'll take questions and do whatever. Cool. <coughs> Any different perspective on all this? Mm -hmm. The other analysis in there, these, these different photo editing shops, this is where you cut your brother's head and put it on a donkey or something like that. You just can have a glass mm -hmm. with them. You're just limited by your imagination, which what you can do with photographs once they're digital. And, uh, Make birthday cards, Sounds like um, something all kinds of things, or photos scanned in. You know, just spend hours and hours working with it, just like I said, limited by your imagination. Mm -hmm. There are several packages out there that have built-in goofy photos, um, like pictures of newspapers, like the Hindenburg blowing up, and you can it'll it'll automatically post someone's picture into that, as you know, them being the person did it. Um, <laughs> pictures of like the five dollar bill that'll automatically take a, a portrait and put it in there for you. If you have kids, you know, especially like young kids that are maybe you know eight, nine years old or so, and are a little interested in phot photography, you buy the cheap 
you can get that Argus camera sometimes for like thirty nine dollars. You can get them even cheaper than that, like a Joy Cam for twenty bucks. You buy that software package. Uh, in one case, it comes with the Argus camera, and you know you, you turn them loose. You know, and, and they'll, they'll one called Fun Factory. Yeah, Fun Factory. Yeah, hundreds of different. Yeah, hundreds of different. Calculates everything from a space van to a night. Just have it last. Yeah. that. I brought my kids a little nice. Al has some pictures of her on these witch like pictures. Slice of witches at telephone book. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. I told her she looked like a million dollars one day. She said, you're kidding me, so I emailed her that. <laughs> <laughs> Did it win you any brownie points? Hmm? Did it win you any brownie points? Not with her, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good try, though, right? Mm. Yeah. Any advantages to capturing your JPEGs off of a camcorder versus a digital camera? Only if you happen to have the camcorder in your hand. Yeah. Uh, the, generally, they camcorders don't take, don't take the pictures. pictures. Like, you know, generally, a, a, a good camcorder, a real good camcorder like this one here, is about 520 lines of resolution, okay? Roughly 1.1 <laughs> megapixel resolution at best, and not the world's best color because they're going for speed. Whereas a, a good digital camera is going to take a lot sharper picture even with the same resolution, it's got a lot more controls for autofocus, white balance, and stuff like that. This camera right here has a button. I could, I could hit it right now, and it would take a snapshot out here, and I can then download that just like it's a still camera. And it takes about a good of quality picture for being a $700 camera, as it Argus does. Okay. Is, that one, is that one with the uh, memory card also? Yes. Yeah, that has a memory card in it. a stick memory card in that one. So generally but speaking... you got that in your hand, and that shot <coughs> presents that opportunity at that point in time. That's all you got. Then you take it. I, I work at Best Buy in the digital camera quarters. Okay. And in the section, I'm just you're learning okay. everything about it. Mm. Playing about it. Sure. You know, you really shouldn't have told us you work at Best Buy. Yeah. You know. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, really expect most of the money. Really expect, money. Yeah, really expect freebies. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? So, with the Roughly, but but again, you know, as we were talking about a one megapixel camera. The problem with all the cameras is you can read all the specs. We bought the Argus camera because the specs were good. There's no place in the specs and no place on these people's website. I can show you the website for the Argus camera. There's a picture from the camera there. There's a first clue. But no place that says that this one takes lousy pictures. The only thing that really matters is the quality of the photograph. Not all of the calls and whistles. Just a couple quick comments. Those of you that were looking for the Excel CD, they do have copies of that now. And also, I'm missing two copies of the library Oh, okay. There's one. Now you're missing one. There's two. I don't think I'm going to get one. I didn't see him on the I have a 1968 Miranda out of the 35 millimeter. Good. It was imported from Japan. I gotta drive. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta He's, coming drive. Drive. Okay. He's coming whether he wants to or not. Well, I drive. No, he drives, but I have to be. I see. Any camera I over said I drive my full time. I took some rubber off the tires. Oh, jeez. Uh -oh. Hey, we're here. Uh, Wait, see, that's why hey, that was kids. the first time. He, he has a problem. You can't need it. I don't have a digital. I'm so unhappy. You should buy a digital back seat. You're going to be pretty quick. There's no one. You know what? There's no fool of it. He has a problem with red. Right. Right there. Shining in the dark. He just doesn't react. Yeah. Yeah. That means stuff. But that means. And I know what it's going to do. And so can I. Yeah. He's probably more concerned about him. But it's like.